All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Cronius Focus Podcast. Uh, today, I'm going to be doing another discussion video, Cronius Talks, Episode 3. Uh, don't really know where this is going to go. We're just going to kind of have a conversation about some of the topics that we've had previous videos about. See if we can, you know, build some ideas around them that's a little more cool and uh, get a little more depth to them. And so without further ado, let's begin. like myself, 11 years of Catholic school, kind of have a lot of internal, I guess, bias or f filters. Uh, I don't want to say against the Bible, but we already have some preconceived notions as to what things that come out of the Bible actually means. And I think when we were talking, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned it's, it's not about the religion necessarily, but more just about the stories told over time to help us improve our fitness. Huh? Yeah. I have to process that. It's not about the religion necessarily. Hmm. I, so I, I really believe that. Well, I guess this is what I'll say, right? I, I firmly believe that religion is a vehicle that encodes moral behavior to allow for increased cooperation, successful increased cooperation amongst humans. And I think that's the, the, the religion specifically is the first step towards eusociality from troop living chimps, right? So I, I don't know when you said like the stories are there to help us increase our fitness score. Yes, 100%. But I don't know that I would agree that it doesn't have anything to do with religion. I think that the, the religion is needed for it. Like they're not different. Like our brains. I, I can, Go ahead. You know, I say I could, see, I could see them going hand in hand. But I guess from a... I don't know, there's one God, all-knowing, hmm. we all live right and we get to heaven type. Like the, the whole encompass of religion and, and what that all entails and all the, the history of built up, um, I guess, ideas behind just the religious piece versus just the, this is how you should live your life in order for us to cooperate well and that's the vehicle to get us to do that if that makes sense well it does but i guess what you're assuming is that humans are strictly rational beings and i i don't think that we are i think you know i guess here would be the questions like do you like the star wars movies sure why I like sci-fi. Why? Well, no, I mean, just I don't mean like what about sci-fi do you like? What I mean is, you take your being and you go plop it in a, a chair and you watch two hours of moving pictures, right, with audio coming out at you. Mm -hmm. Why? Entertainment. But that, how does that have any value to you? Why do you need entertainment? Like, like you have to strip the human context out of it and say, chimps don't do that, ants don't do that, bees don't do that, humans do that. Why? Why do? Why are we obsessed with storytelling? 
that's all you're you're going there and you're 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 doing nothing other than to listen and to watch a story play out why I don't know. Are we are we kind of ob obsessed with hearing about story? Like we like the stories. We like storytelling. We we want to know what would happen if something happened. Like it kind of puts you outside of. It gives you additional experiences in a compressed amount of time. Well, that's those are all possibilities. But I guess the fundamental question you have to ask is. Do species generally behave in a certain way when it's not advantageous to them in some form or fashion? And while there, I, I would definitely concede that there are behaviors that may have no real purpose. I think there are few and far between. And, and the examples would be like um, the animals getting drunk off of like rotten fruit or something like that. You know what I mean? Like those things mm -hmm. are kind of parasitic on a system that was meant to be there intentionally. And while I allow for that in, in the human experience too, we are really, we really, especially children really like stories. Like human children really like stories. They love fairy tales. They love nursery rhymes. They love, they love you telling your own stories as a parent. And it's just what f there's, I am, I'm, what I am saying is I firmly believe there is a function being executed when you go to watch a story that you like. It, it has a utilitarian value to it. And my question, that's my assumption, right? So my question is if you believe that that is true, that those actions do have value to you and you pay money to do that, which means you've assigned a value to it in your life, what value do they actually have? And I reject the entertainment, like go deeper. Like what are you getting out of it? What do you think? I think, I think you're getting, I think you're getting a non-intellectual source of information. That's what I think you're getting. I, I think that the human being isn't just intellect. And I think that it needs imprintation of information at different levels. Okay. So here's a, here's a good example, right? Information's, you know, people like talk about evolution around just genetic code and as though the information storage is just genetic. And I, that's completely false. And there's, I mean, and just from a biological perspective, there's epigenetic information as well, but let's, let's ignore that and come up one level and just go back to the Calhoun mice experiment. All of the genetic information of the socially like fine mice, like the, the healthy society mice, was pretty much the same as this genetic information of the unhealthy, collapsing, autistic, doesn't know how to breed mice. But, but if you took one of those autistic mice that was part of a collapsing society out of it, even though they were of breeding age and you put them into a healthy population that had, that was doing fine, they could never reproduce anyway. And so the answer is that if you just look at that, like some information, the information about how to reproduce, how to be a social mouse was lost. It, they didn't have it anymore. So that means it couldn't be stored genetically. Otherwise they would have been born with it. And that, that means that information had to be stored somewhere else. And, my theory, and I think it's not even really a theory, it, there's almost no other answer, is that it was stored in the hierarchy and the interconnections between the neural network brains of the individuals. The society itself, the social fabric of the mice, stored the information about how to maintain the social fabric of the mice. It's like a okay. distributed network for storage. So the same thing goes for humans. You're not born knowing how to be a civilized human being at, at all levels, right? Not just the intellectual level, but you have an emotional center. You have a physical center as well. And you have to, those, those 
those parts of your brain have to be trained correctly <laughs> so they can interact in society. Mm -hmm. And so you wrestle with a two-year-old so that they understand how they can move their body and how they can not hurt others when they, when, when they use too much force, right? You wrestle with them so they learn that. And you dance so they learn how to control their movements. And you teach them stories about controlling their emotions, right? And that doesn't mm -hmm. stop at two or three. It goes all the way up till you're, you need, you're never done learning. And so what we do is we encode this information in multi-layered, deep meaning mythologies that become the basis for the movies that you watch. That's the reason why, that's the reason why they just keep telling the same stories over and over again. There's only really two stories. It's like romance and adventure. And you, you apparently like the futuristic adventure movies called sci-fi, but it's still adventure. You know? Yeah. I don't know. That makes sense. Yeah, I, that's what I think. I think that, and that's what I think the religious aspect of it is, right? Is that it, it's the, it's the encoding of the information in distilled form about how you as an individual need to interact with other individuals within this framework. And that's why the religion dies when the civilization dies. You know, there aren't many people worshiping Ra right now, but when Egypt was around, everyone did because they were, they were that those stories encoded how to be an Egyptian. Okay. I get, the, I guess that's interesting too. When you, when you say that about children growing up and sharing those pieces with them incorporated in religion in order for them to i guess know how to be like a effective member of the society right yeah makes sense yeah and i know we probably we probably talked about that in one of our first first talks because i think we i kind of remember addressing that a little bit but yeah. What about, um, uh, I know like socialism is, is, was one of on your, your last, uh, oh, Marx and Cain. Yeah. Yeah. The Marx and Cain. And, and I, I don't know. I, I, I thought it was rather interesting in that comparison and, and maybe we can talk about it. And I think the, the other piece that I really wanted to talk about was, you know, why do you think, the idea of socialism and, and, you know, we can all opine on it and give our opinion, but why do you think that socialism is so appealing to the younger generation and, and, you know, all this activism for just I, I, not necessarily equality. Cause that's not, I don't think a lot of those issues that are being discussed now are the same thing as socialism, but I feel like socialism is not a dirty word anymore. It's not a dirty word anymore. And that's, that's, that's a failure on the part of our civilization. And I don't, and it's not so much the socialism aspect, right? Like there's a vein of, of nurturing and taking care of your, your people that that really isn't the evil part of what socialism is. And that's why when I did that episode on, on Marx and Cain, I didn't talk about the, you know, the welfare systems or the, or the attempts at, at charity really. Right. And even state sponsored charity. And, and there's, there are, there's a good critique that state sponsored charity is not effective. Right. And, but that's at a political level. It, that's not, you can talk about the efficiency of the system being better or worse in a pure economics or political terms. That's, and that's not what I wanted to focus on. Marx has a, a mythological error 
and 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 so anything from a marxist lens is evil and i mean that in like the strictest sense of the terms is that So, so many of our society are ideologically possessed right now. And okay. it's, it's colored their entire worldview in really unhealthy ways. So I don't know. I, again, I think that, that the United States... And, and the Western Europe, we'll say, um, learned the lessons from World War II only on one side. And it's because, I think it's because in order to defeat Hitler, we chose to ally with Stalin. And I don't, again, I'm, I'm not making a moral judgment of that. I, I didn't live then. It, you know, it was a difficult time to be alive. Um, with really the death of God, like Nietzsche talked about, uh, it, it was a tumultuous time, right? That everyone was promising these utopian states and defeating that really became the responsibility of the United States and France and England, basically. Um, so choosing the far right to go after while allying the far left gave us today because when we defeated Hitler and the far right and the, and the fascist bend of these utopian ideas um, that effectively inoculated us against those ideas, roughly speaking, right? We wrote the history down. We taught the history. We could, we could, we could mythologize our conquest over the the evil right-wing dictators right but because we didn't have the gall to finish and go after moscow like Patton suggested we couldn't do that with the left and instead we had to fight really a proxy war for decades right that well i mean <laughs> we're just not inoculated against the ideas like if you were to ask the average person like who is the most brutal dictator of all time like which dictator has um the most bodies attributed to them right in deaths i guarantee you the majority of college educated left-leaning students would say hitler and Hitler's mm -hmm. not even close. <laughs> like Mao is, Mao's worth something like eight Hitlers, I want to say. And Stalin's worth four, or uh, maybe not four. Maybe I think Stalin's worth two or three Hitlers. As far as deaths, and that's and that's with you know, gracious, gracious counting, because the history's books, you know. The, the, the Stalinists and, the, and the, Mao, the Maoists specifically never were defeated. So those are all estimates from historians. There's no, we don't have good numbers. We, we probably have overcounted Hitler's numbers and undercounted Stalin's and Mao's more than likely, just given the, the nature of wartime propaganda, right? And the fact that Hitler was our enemy and Stalin was somebody we would excuse. So I don't know, man, it's not a good thing. And the worst part is, is that they masquerade under the, all these, what would you call them, egalitarian ideas. Oh, well, we got to help the poor and the dispossessed and the unfortunate souls and all the oppressed. And, and like, you know what they're missing from that conversation? It, you know what it is? It's an Oedipal mom. That's exactly what it is. Instead of demanding that those elements within our society that are suffering take responsibility for their own suffering, which is the Christian notion, right? Take responsibility for your own actions and then bear your cross and march up the hill to save yourself. Something like that, right? Towards salvation. They don't, we're not demanding that of anybody. 
every action's excused, every failure is excused within the framework of this oppressed oppressor relationship, which that's what Marx, that's what Marx and Engel really started. They, they, they decided to put the group first. And the thing is, it's so easy to do it. As soon as you put the group before the individual, you can excuse any action and you can justify any response as well, which is probably the scariest notion for me is how much of our society right now has justified the burnings of cities in the recent past, right? Like Portland's on fire and normally reasonable people are justifying that because of some perceived injustice in the system on group on the basis of group analysis right and it just doesn't even fit the majority of people burning the cities down are white males they're not even in a press group it doesn't i don't know man mm. within the context of the of the of the ideology that is i don't really think any group is oppressed I don't think groups can be oppressed, just like I don't think groups can be oppressors. Individuals are oppressed, and individuals can be oppressors. Groups can't be victims of things. I mean, and I mean that ideologically. I don't mean, obviously, more than one person can be a victim of the same act, right? Like, you can have a, a set of people that are a victim. But I, that doesn't mean that every single person that shares X attribute with those people is also a victim of the same action. Doesn't doesn't work like that, and it's an unhealthy way to look at the world. I guess that's fair, dude. I mean, look, like history is complex. Like, and again, the I think the appropriate perspective of analysis is you analyze things and outcomes on the basis of an individual first, and then you lens it after the individual is analyzed through group proclivities, right? Because statistics don't lie. You, you can see differential outcomes by groups, but the right, like that's not the right perspective when dealing with people because we don't, you don't deal with a group. A group can't be guilty of something. Just like a group can't be a victim of something. I mean, what does that mean? How does a group take responsibility? Which is kind of the call that the leftists are making. It's like, you know, white people need to take responsibility for the institutional racism of the United States. How do you practically do that? Who are white people? And, and how do they as a group do anything? Like the group can't act, only individuals can act. And that's, that's the problem with the analysis. And what happened in the Soviet Union, if you read, especially read the Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn, like, they blamed everything on the bourgeoisie and then and then so they collectivized the farms right and then everyone started starving and the supply chains got messed up and so what did they do and instead of instead of saying hey like maybe this overall idea is wrong they came up with a new villain and the new villain was the engineers who were designing the things or the farmers who took over the collectivized farms or the people running the supply chain they called them wreckers that they were intentionally sabotaging the stuff right intentionally doing it just to make things worse and again it's it's because as soon as the reason they were able to get away with that is as soon as you allow yourself to 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 think along the lines of group guilt you can justify anything and what that does is it, there's a really interesting case, right? Like actually in current modern news, the, uh, that little five-year-old boy that was shot by that, uh, the black guy in, I don't remember where, what city, um, he's arrested now, right? But what's interesting is, I read a news article that said something to the effect of, we should consider charging the perpetrator with manslaughter instead of first degree murder because it was possible that uh, he was provoked from a racial slur that the kid might have said, or that the dad might have said, or something like that. So he was provoked into the action. And if you think about that just for a second, like, like 
what they're basically implying is that because the five-year-old child is part of an oppressor group, namely white male, and the perpetrator is a part of an oppressed group, black male, that his action in there is now mitigated as far as responsibility goes because of an utterance from a five-year-old child. I, I just can't even believe that 2020, the United States of America, that's something that I would read as if it's normal. Like that's not, that's not right. It's not even close is, to right. That is interesting. Cause I, I hadn't, I, I, again, I had just briefly perused uh, that story. Um, but it, 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 now that you mentioned that having that be a normal normalcy, I guess that it is okay to act based on a provocation of some sort of derogatory term towards a group. You, you know, it's, it's funny cause I actually had this discussion the other day, uh, with, with my 12 year old and it was basically, Hey, look, man, cause he, he came to me and, and they're really into video games, right? Like all young kids are now. Um, but they, they rage all the time and they fight with each other and they're, they're nasty with each other. And, and he came upstairs and was talking about how he was, how he was pissed at his friend because of X, Y, and Z. And he said this to me and he did this to me. And, you know, immediately my gut reaction is, well, you need to be the bigger man and you need to walk away from that. And you're letting him win by letting that bother you and, and all that stuff. And it's, it's just, I don't know. I just, I just was drawing that conclusion as you were talking because it's, it's exactly what you try to raise your children to avoid is, Hey man, people are going to try to oppress and whatnot and, or, or try to bring you down and, and you letting that bother you, that's, that's a failure on your part. And if it's something where you're the one who caused them to react that way, then you know what, you need to take ownership of your, your vulnerabilities or ownership of your actions and your negative behaviors and decide, Hey, how do I make this better? Right back to the cane story. It's how do I, how do I take this failure and turn it into like, what do I need to do to make this better? I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, it's well, you know, they've, they've equated, they, t they stripped the responsibility of action from the individual. That, and that's really what it is. Like, they've diminished and this is it's so freaking insulting man like it pisses me off because what they're really saying to that guy who shot the five-year-old is that he wasn't responsible for his own actions so that that means he's not even a human being but you know what i'm saying like that's the kind of stuff that we reserve for the mentally diminished like we, we stripped them of responsibility for their own actions. It's insulting. And they're basically saying that because of his race and the history of oppression, he's not responsible for his own action. I, I just, I can't be more offended by that statement. I just, it's so racist in its core. And it blows me away that the people that are supposedly anti-racist expect so little of others because solely of their race i don't care what you look like where you come from what family you're raised in i expect you not to shoot a five-year-old in the face because of something he says i think that any human being should have the self-restraint to not shoot a five-year-old in the face over something that five-year-old says i'm simply stating that we that that level of mitigation being allowed is treating them as though they're not a human being. And that's not okay in my book. I don't believe that. That's not a way to have a functioning society. You shouldn't have different standards for behavior based on, based on historical oppression. differences in law. Well, it's, I don't even want to use the word oppression. Like, cause that makes it sound as though like, I, I, I don't want to be in their framework cause it's complicated. Not all African Americans were slaves, and not all slaves were African American. You know, one of the you know history is is more complex than that. Like m the majority of people that are doing very well nowadays are descendants from serfs. 
the Irish were slaves. You know what I mean? Like African Americans were slave owners in the United States. Like it's 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 a it's a complex sea of thing. And so when you when you analyze the system, you try to right the wrongs of the past by dicing it up and saying, well, this group here is oppressed and this group here is the oppressor. None of those people are even alive anymore. So all you're doing is excusing continued failure. And I don't like that because it doesn't help anybody. Well, you see, I feel like I had this conversation with a, a good friend of mine probably back in college, and I think it came about because um, of the just, I don't know, I thought it was interesting that there was something, that, you know, that affirmative action in college entrance applications was a thing. And I, I kind of was, you know, I, I made the point, and, you know, whether it's naive or I don't, I'd love to hear your opinion on it, but I kind of figured you know, hey, why can't we all be, you know, treated based off of merit? And then his response was, well, because there's social or there's economic disparity based off of decisions made in the past for certain groups um, and genders, and that should be reversed in order to balance back out the scales. Yeah, I see. I don't. Be, I don't buy that crap at all. I think that's. I think that's naive. Because there's no way to do that. There's no effective way to do that. How do you measure someone's level of oppression? Well, and, and not to mention that that I, I guess the perception of of me and and you know I, I guess I'm a white male, obviously. So my in, interpretation of that was if if there was in fact an impression, which uh, you know obviously you know history we all we we all could read history and see what what went down and obviously we don't experience that we don't know what that's exactly like necessarily but then you know you see something where i perceive i'm going to college i'm a i'm a young white male and i'm going to college and it's i'm perceiving that the the scales are not tipped in my favor because of the fact of my gender and skin color i don't know i just i i thought that was an interesting concept that by by virtue of trying to make things fair you're making things unfair for the uh, oppressor the class. other group yeah the oppressor like uh, air quote oppressor group yeah well You know, all of that would be fine and dandy if you were writing some sort of systematic injustice that you could actually point to. But I mean, here's a fact that nobody wants to reconcile with, right? The, well, let's just say the, the, uh, the socioeconomic condition of the group labeled African American in all the statistics. I can say unequivocally has nothing to do with how they look or their race. And I can say that because a subsection of them, and they're not really called that, but a subsection of people who have the exact same racial makeup and appearance, namely Nigerian immigrants outperform whites on the socioeconomic measurements. So as soon as you like throw that into the, into the equation, you, you think about that, like, are Nigerian Americans just an outlier or something special about them? You know, they're black. If there was any systemic injustice based on some sort of perceived race from the system, why would they outperform whites? You got a response? That's huh. Yeah. I mean, one of these things is not like the other, and there's only two differences, right? Because a lot of the African descendants uh, from slavery were from Nigeria, right? Like, like that the, we we enslaved them too. The difference being, right? Uh, the difference is base culture and their view, their primary view of of what. And I think that's the main thing is that you know the left has really they've nurtured this this victim complex within lots of segments of our population you know the the, the we'll say the sexuality non-conforming segments 
they've done it in the uh, in the female segment for sure and they've done it in the um person of color segment which is a really weird term but those three segments of people the left is actively nurturing the worst in them the the it's 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 fostering the notion that their outcomes aren't it's Cain, right? It's not you. The reason you, your sacrifices aren't working and that you're not gaining what you should be isn't because you're doing it wrong. It's because God and the system is messed up. That's what they're saying over and over again to everybody. It's the patriarchy or it's the white like colonizers or it's those Christian heterosexual like bible thumpers for the for the homosexual groups right like it's always like their their outcomes are a result of external to them things and as soon as you allow that you quit growing and trying and striving and you accept that you're never going to get anywhere because you're black or you're a woman or you're gay like it's just it's terrible and the worst part about it, everything is it's it's that it's this implicit racism of like low expectations that comes right along with it cuz cuz then they use that to explain bad or what not even bad it's like unhealthy behaviors well, if they're okay, they're justified in this thing because of the historical oppression or because of the systematic racism or bigotry or patriarchy, sexism, whatever the ism is. And it doesn't really matter what the ism is because it's all just a bunch of responsibility shuffling off of the individual and onto a group. They fundamentally can't take group, take, can't take responsibility. I, I reject that wholeheartedly and put all of the responsibility back on the individual. If you aren't where you want to be in life, it's your responsibility to fix that. Quit making excuses. Quit trying to shovel off the responsibility of your bad outcomes onto other people. Bullshit. It's you. Fix yourself and you'll get where you want to be. If you that, That's the only practical framework to live in. If you live in any other framework, you stagnate because you don't keep trying. You have to assume the system is fine and it's you, your failure to adapt to it, that's the problem. I agree. I agree with that. I think I think the, the caveat there is the system isn't perfect, but it's a lot easier to change yourself than it is to change the system. Because at, at this point, we don't even know you know, again, I like the assumption, but we don't know if, if the system is right, wrong, or indifferent. And I don't know if we as an individual or even alleged acting as a group to affect change on a system because we think something is right or wrong or indifferent. But I would mention this. I read a book called Extreme Ownership. I don't know if you've read it. Yeah. Uh, by Jocko Wilkin Willick. Yeah. Um, oh, man. Yeah, and so he was a uh, he was a uh, what was he uh, a Navy SEAL yeah. or a Green Beret? No, he's um, a I think. Yeah, and so he he basically estouts you know he does business coaching now, and it's basically whenever there was an issue, I didn't look at what went wrong externally because stuff goes wrong externally all the time, but because something happened, it was my lack of preparedness for what went wrong externally. Exactly. So I needed to be better prepared or, and instead of making an excuse of why I failed or why my team failed or why my unit failed, it was more of a, okay, it was my fault because I didn't do X, Y, and Z. And then immediately he went to the able side, again, to bring up Kane and Abel and said, okay, how do I make myself better so this doesn't happen in the future? And that's the only way that you get better. You can't get better by making excuses about external forces. Yeah. I don't know. I just really like that book. Yeah. When you have a bad outcome, right, from something that you're attempting to do, if you assume the bad outcome is an injustice, the chances that you're going you're gonna to grow from that 
which is a really good lesson to have, by the way. Failure is ha failing forward is how you how you grow, right? If you assume that failure is not your own fault, though, and it's the fault of an injustice in society, how can you ever grow? You can't. You'll never reflect on what you did wrong. You'll never have that mindset. So, I, I had a I heard a good a very very interesting. I really liked this comment, and and I forget the the person who said it, but it was on a podcast I was listening to the other day. And he said, failure is the manure that fertilizes the fields of success for tomorrow. Yeah, man. Yeah. And what they're, and you know what they're doing? You know what the leftists are doing? They're saying all that manure that you're creating in your oppressed group. Well, the reason it's manure and not bricks of gold is because those guys across the field with all the plants that are growing. Yeah, they tricked you. They kept you from actually shitting gold. Go beat them up. That's what's going to happen. That's the end result of all of this. Because you can justify violence against anyone because they're part of an oppressor group. See it in the videos, man, from the protests in Portland. You know, grown men hitting elderly women in front of their stores. Just, just you know, acts that, that you would never expect a civilized society to do. All being done because, well, it, everything is okay in the name of equality. Everything. Yeah. And, to, and to, to stay on that same analogy, right? It's you have the, the, the side that doesn't have any, any, anything growing and the side that does have stuff growing. Let's go, let's go approach them as a group and steal some of their crop so that we can have it. Yep. That's the future, man. That's our path that we're on right now. I, I honestly don't see us getting away from that. I, I, um, it feels like we passed the point of no return somewhere in, in the mid 20 teens. And I, uh, you know, it just, I, could, I saw those opinion polls where Black Lives Matter was something like 60% positive support. And that it just, I don't know how you recover from that as a nation, as a civilization. Because again, it's not, it's, this isn't the sixties anymore. It, and these aren't these aren't marches for like legitimate systemic changes, right? If 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 they were talking about like marching for equal voting access or something that was legally like actual injustice, there would be you know if they're calling for change in that manner, that's different. It, it's the cry nowadays is so Marx in its origin. And has nothing to do with political reforms. It it's something like, you know, they 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 just again it. It's not this law is bad and we need to change that. Hey, you know, it would be really nice if, if black kids could go to the same school as white kids when they live next door, right? Something like that. It would be really reasonable in today's age to to pass if those laws existed. Now it's, systemic racism exists. And so we have to defund the police in order to, to stop systemic racism. Like, you can't even act on that. Well, you can. The only action you can take on that is to tear the system down. And that's what people are doing. And that's why people are compelled to do that, because the call is, the system is corrupt. Okay, well, what about the system? All of it. Well, then you burn everything to the ground. That's what you do. Because the whole thing is corrupt. That's what you're saying. It's all injustice. And that's why, again, that's why Cain killed Abel, right? Because the whole system was corrupt. So you had to burn it to the ground. I don't know, man. It's not healthy. You know, I, uh, I read a, an interesting story and saw a pretty, pretty intense uh, body camera video. <laughs> And no, it, it was a it was a, a, a guy in um, it, and actually he was a, a, a friend of a friend, which is interesting. A guy out of Arizona, uh, his name was Ryan Whitaker. If you want to if you want to Google that body cam footage and it's it, basically the premise is him and his girlfriend uh, were or actually a neighbor. They were in an apartment complex. A neighbor called on a noise complaint and said that him and his girlfriend were arguing um, the girlfriend's story later recounts that they were uh, playing music loud and playing video games. So, you know, 
and the, and the neighbor, the, the 911 call was kind of interesting because it sounded like the neighbor was more frustrated than anything, just like he wanted to get to sleep. And he's, you know, said that, I don't know, they were arguing if, if, if there was violence in the, if it sounded like there was violence, would the police come out there sooner to shut, shut them down or whatever? Anyway, police come out and knock on the door and apparently the, the music was playing pretty loud. Um, and then they, they, they knocked on the door again. And of course, police, they always announce themselves, you know, uh, Phoenix PD or whatever. Yeah. Um, he answers the door with uh, his sidearm in his hand. Okay. So he answers the door with a sidearm in his hand and kind of yells, what? And then as soon as the police, as soon as he, what appears, looks like he realizes it's the police, he goes down into a defensive position, lays the gun on the ground, and one of the offer, officers fires three shots in his back. And this is a, 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 a white guy. Yeah. So, I, and I don't know, I, I saw other videos where, you know, police are killing uh, animals uh, in drug houses that, that weren't dangerous, you know, they weren't attacking. And then they, they stated that the animal was attacking them or, or going after their unit. So I, I don't know if I believe that this, the whole system is broken, but I, but I think that there's probably some truth in that, you know, either, I don't know who would do the job if there was more accountability, uh, more accountability with police. Cause I sure wouldn't, but there, there needs to be, I mean, these are the enforcers of our, our laws. They should be of the highest, <laughs> you know, no, no, it's like the Judge Dredd, right? Do you remember that movie, Judge Dredd? Yeah, man. The enforcers of the law should be of the highest caliber and the highest ethics possible. And, and we should hold them to a higher standard. Now we have to pay them a whole lot more to get them to actually do the job and get the right people in that job. But I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily just just racial. I, I I don't know. I think I think there is some some reform needed, but I don't. It's not the reform where we burn it all to the ground either. Well, look, man. If somebody came out and said something to the effect of, like I have since since a long time ago, the police are overly militarized and need to be demilitarized. They're being used in ways they shouldn't be used, et cetera, et cetera. Those are reasonable claims, right? That's not what we're getting. What we're getting is defund the police while vast sections of cities are being basically annexed by a leftist authoritarian group. And I, I don't even know what else to call them. Like chop. <laughs> like, what? Like, <laughs> like, what? like, is this real life? <laughs> and, and the worst part is our own government, like the Seattle city government, just let them have city hall. The cops let them burn down a precinct all over. You know, I watched the full body cam videos of George Floyd. And I remember when, when the first, when it first came out, um, you know, the video looked bad. It did like, you know, he was on his neck and the guy saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And I remember, I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, man like something about this whole story just doesn't fit because i have trouble believing that someone could like okay let's say one guy was a serial like let's say that derek chauvin was a serial killer and just a complete psychopath right fine but what bothered me about the video was that his 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 partner stood there looking at him doing the same thing the whole time and didn't ever intervene and that's, you know, we're not at that level of societal decay yet where people could be that indifferent to somebody dying. And it bothered me. And then, you know, the, the autopsy came out and he had high levels of drugs in his system, which added layers of complexity to the story. But nobody cared about that. But finally, they, they leaked all this, this full body cam footage. And, you know, I remember watching Chappelle's episode and, and Chappelle... Chappelle's late. He he uh, he did like a what was it eight thirty four or so, some Netflix special comedy thing during this coronavirus pandemic where he basically talked for I don't know thirty minutes about George Floyd, 
And he kept repeating over and over and over again. They had this guy on the ground for eight minutes and some odd seconds and with his knee in his neck and he's begging for, for his life and he knows he's going to die and he keeps saying he can't breathe over and over again. And the whole time, like everyone's saying this, something was missing. And when they released the full body cam footage, you watch it and they arrested the guy and the guy is is completely drugged out of his mind from the moment of the initial reaction and interaction. They put him in the back of the cop car and as soon as he gets in the back of the cop car and he's just handcuffed, nobody's touching him at all. He's sitting by himself in the back of the cop car. He starts saying over and over again, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I'm claustrophobic, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, over and over again. And he starts flipping out and they have to pull him out of the cop car and that's where the, the cell phone video cuts in of him saying, I can't breathe over and over again. And you put yourself in, in the officer's shoes and it's like, this guy had been saying he can't breathe in the back of the cop car for like 30 seconds when nobody was touching him. Why would I assume that the reason he's saying that has anything to do with what's going on right now? His current state, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then it shows when they put him in the ambulance, he still has a heartbeat. When he gets in the back of the ambulance, he wasn't dead. He, he had a heartbeat when he got into the ambulance. I mean, we just burned our entire country down, massive riots, increasing spread of a virus, which everyone claims is, is the end of the world, all over a black man that died of a fentanyl overdose because the cop was white who detained him. And we believed what we saw we, we saw a white officer with his knee in a black man's neck. And the black man was saying, I can't breathe. And instead of saying, hey, hold up, like, let's assume the best of people. Let's assume that, like, maybe there's some rational explanation other than the fact that this guy's a freaking monster. We didn't even stop to think. We just started tearing everything down. And... And then when context gets added, I haven't heard anyone say, you know, and the worst, he's still in jail. Derek Chauvin is, is still in jail, in jail, in jail. His wife left him. Like I watched the body cam footage and look, I mean, I've talked to some liberal friends of mine too that, that were appalled by it. And after they watched the full body cam footage, they're like, he needs to be released from jail. And I agree charges should be dropped they're not going to get him on murder too there's no way you could prove murder too because you can't even prove that he like if the guy is saying he can't breathe when he's sitting in the back of the cop car because he claims he's claustrophobic he's obvious like look that entire situation is a guy ODing on drugs on video while the cops try to detain him that's it that explains the entire interaction but let me ask you this yeah so what happened when they drop charges and they when they if they do drop charges it will that they will tear this everyone everyone that's on the left like that will be in the streets again over the same thing and the worst part is it's the right thing to do our system demands it they're not going to get him on murder too and they're going to have a real tough time proving manslaughter if they can prove he had a heartbeat in the ambulance. And I saw the video, I saw the EKG going, he had a heartbeat in the ambulance, which means that Derek Chauvin didn't kill him. So what charge are you gonna get him on? He had like six times the OD dose of fentanyl in his system on autopsy. And I don't remember exactly if that's right, but it was a huge amount of fentanyl in his system. It's a tragic case, man. It really is. It would have been excellent if the ambulance had gotten there sooner. It would have been excellent if they had known he had done drugs in the first place. It would have been excellent if if George Floyd hadn't have taken those drugs, right? It would have been really excellent if we had spent a whole bunch of time over the last four decades instead of fighting a war on drugs, we had done something actually productive and, um, you know, like treat, treated it as a medical issue. I'm all for that. The problem is, well, I, I, that's a little conspiracy theorist. I won't get into that so much. <laughs> I was going to say, the CIA doesn't like any competition, man. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. They need to Tell be able to, to fund their own stuff, man. They got to be the only dealer in town. 
Jeez. Yeah, that's a conversation for another podcast. <laughs> Put the tinfoil hat on, start talking about the CIA. But you see my point, right? Like, everyone saw what they wanted to see in that video. <laughs> they saw an oppressor killing an oppressed. And what they should have seen is a public servant in an impossible position dealing with a drug addict, which is tragic, but in that light, he doesn't deserve to be in jail. He didn't mean to kill the guy. That wasn't his intent going into the situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I think that happens more often, more often than not. And you know what? I've, I've never been someone who considered myself political. I mean, I, I like, I have opinions on ideas, but I wouldn't necessarily say I'm this or this and, you know, just basically color, color coordinate myself with blue or red, right? Every, every ideal that I have either fits in blue or red and that's it. Um, but I would say I've never like really thought about it more than over the course of the last probably five years of, you know, how it, how we all are being pulled to either be you're in or you're out or you're on one side or you're the other. And if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And if you're not speaking up about it, you're the same as a, as an oppressor. Uh, it's just, it's, it's kind of sad, but I don't know. I'm, I, I guess, I guess where I was going with that is, having two people that are on two sides of, a, of an ideal, right, can watch a video and have two entirely different interpretations and go do two entirely different, I guess, group justified things for or against whatever they just watched. And, and their mind is fully convinced that they're doing the right thing and the end justifies the means. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to because when you allow yourself to be possessed so one of the results of, of of the death of God in our society is that 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 this is again I'm just speculating here but this is kind of how I think about it right one of the results of the death of God in our society and of the religious imprintation of moral behavior is that that circuitry in the brain that encodes that information is hungry for it and that opens you up it's like because that's empty now in everybody and the nihilism can't just live there it opens you up to a form of ideological possession where the ideology imprints on that and encodes your moral behavior and so well let's just take so if you think of christianity as a religion right one of the tenets of Christianity for moral behavior is uh, like the Cain and Abel story. Like never assume that those of you that are successful, or those of your peers that are successful are there un, uh, undeservedly. Because if you do that, you'll, you'll spiral out of control and basically end up taking revenge upon your brother, right? So we, that's a moral proclamation in there it's a way of being is that you always it's that goes back to that stoic notion but in absence of that what imprints instead is something like feminism and inside of the feminist ideology it's like an incomplete mythology right it doesn't it doesn't have the full picture it doesn't take into account both perspectives because there's no narrative balance to it it's just evil patriarchy oppressive patriarchy victimized good feminine and that's it and they explain every single aspect of our society and every interaction people have with that framework in mind and and so when you're possessed by that and so i'll tell you what i'm gonna read you this facebook post this will be interesting i'd like to get your take on this To the other adults in the room, this is fine. A grown man looms behind my three-year-old daughter. Occasionally, he will poke or tickle her, 
and she responds by shrinking, smaller and smaller with each unwanted advance. I imagine her trying to become slight enough to slip out of her booster seat and slide under the table. When my mother views this scene, she sees playful taunting, a grandfather engaging with his granddaughter. May, my tone cuts through the din of a family, a familiar family gathering together. She does not look at me. May, I start again. You can tell him no, May. If this isn't okay, you could say something like, Papa, please back up. I would like some space for my body. As I say the words, my stepfather, the bulldog, leans in a little closer, hovering just above her head. His tenebrous grin taunts me as my daughter accordions her 30-pound frame, hoping to escape his tickles and hot breath. I repeat myself with a little more force. She finally peeks up at me. Mama, can you say it? Surprise. A three-year-old girl doesn't feel comfortable defending herself against a grown man. A man that has stated he loves and cares for her over and over again, and yet stands here showing zero concern for her wishes about her own body. I ready myself for battle. Papa, please back up. May would like some space for her potty. My voice is firm but cheerful. He does not move. Papa, I should not have to ask you twice. Please back up. May is uncomfortable. Oh, relax, he says, ruffling his wispy blonde ha hair. Ruffling her wispy blonde hair. The patriarchy stands patronizing me in my own damn kitchen. We're just playing. His southern drawl does not charm me. No, you were playing. She was not. She's made it clear that she would like some space. Now please back up. I can play how I want with her. He says, straightening his posture. My, test, my chest tightens. The sun-bleached hairs on my arms stand on attention as this man, who has been my father figure for more than three decades, enters the battle ring. No, no, you cannot play however you want with her. It's not okay to have fun with someone who does not want to play. He opens his mouth to respond, but my rage is palpable through my measured response. I wonder if my daughter can feel it. I hope she can. He retreats to the living room, and my daughter stares up at me. Her eyes, a starburst of blue and hazel, shine with admiration for her mama. The dragon has been slayed, for now. My own mother is silent. She refuses to make eye contact with me. This is the same woman who shut me down when I told her about a sexual assault I had recently come to acknowledge. This is the same woman who was abducted by a careful a car full of strangers as she walked home one night. She fought and screamed until they kicked her out. Speeding away, they ran over her ankle and left her with a, li a lifetime of physical and emotional pain. It's the same woman who said nothing, who could say nothing as her boss and his friends sexually harassed her for years. This is the same woman who married one of those friends. When my mother views this scene, she sees her daughter overreacting. She sees me making a big deal out of nothing. Her concerns lie more in maintaining the status quo, quo and cradling my stepdad's toxic ego than in protecting the shrinking three-year-old in front of her. When I view this scene, I am both bolstered and dismayed. My own strength and refusal to keep quiet is the result of hundreds, probably thousands of women being mistreated and their protests go ignored. It is the result of watching my own mother suffer quietly at the hands of too many men. It is the result of my own mistreatment and my solemn vow to be part of the ending of the cycle. It would be so easy to see a little girl being taunt that her wishes don't matter, that her body is not her own, that even people she loves will mistreat and ignore her, and that all of this is okay in the name of other people, men having fun. But what I see instead is a little girl watching her mama. I see a little girl learning that her voice matters, that her wishes matter. I see a little girl learning that she is allowed and expected to say no. I see her learning that this is not okay. I hope my mom is learning something too. November 21st, 2018. Fighting the Patriarchy, One Grandpa at a Time by Lisa Norgren. What are your thoughts on that, man? To be honest, I... I... I'm even afraid to comment on that. Dude, I, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
no, I mean, I, I, I hear, I hear the story, right? And I understand, I mean, okay. So before I say, I understand both perspectives based on my hearing the story and putting myself in both people's shoes, I can see where both sides have pros and cons about their actions. That's, that's what I would say. Now, I'm not necessarily going to say I'm walking the line of, uh, you know, political correctness, uh, as it appears, but I don't know. I, I think, uh, I think there's, there's some justifications in what exactly constitutes playful teasing by a, by a, a family member and where does it go too far? And, and, and I don't think that this was one of those circumstances, but I would say that that's probably come up in human history before where oh, no you know, playing with your brother or sister and, and you go too far and then all of a sudden it's no longer playing and you're, you know, throwing the Xbox controller at each other or whatever the case may be. But I don't know. Okay, let me ask you a question. Do you think when she was in this moment that she saw her stepdad as a person or did she instead see him as a monstrous manifestation of the evil, evil patriarchy? The, the latter, of course. She even described it as the, the dragon has been slain. Yeah, oh yeah. Do you think that she saw her daughter as her daughter or as the quintessential victim feminine of all time? incarnate okay. a one three-year-old i'm picking up what you're putting down yeah yeah i could see that where you we're stripping away the individual and stripping away the, the the humanity and you're just identifying them with their stereotyped groups and maybe you're bringing additional framework or, or filters from yourself into that situation so uh, let, me, let me be real succinct on this right i've dealt with situations very similar to this it, they're called being a parent it's very normal have five daughters i have four of them that are past three years old now dealt with this a lot okay here's what she should have done should have been a parent and a loving child should have walked over picked her three-year-old up and said hey dad she's getting a little overwhelmed i think we need to stop for a little bit so she can like have have a moment end of the encounter walked away her dad no issues no issues guarantee you can do that in a non-confrontational way the reason that she didn't do that is because she didn't view it from the lens of here's my father missing the cues from my daughter which is could have been an honest mistake right maybe he just didn't he didn't see that she was overwhelmed people do that you miss social cues right instead she saw him as the manifestation the dragon to be slain and you should see the comments in this thread on facebook man she this lady's got almost a hundred thousand likes and loves right eleven thousand comments one hundred thirty five thousand shares on this post nobody so, nobody is saying this this lady screwed up royally and she did so because she was ideologically possessed she turned a potentially traumatic situation for a three-year-old into one that was definitely traumatic. High stakes conflict that should have been playful interaction with grandpa. And so some of the people that I've talked to about this specific post have said, well, you know, she's alluding to the fact that he was abusive, right? The grandpa was abusive. She, she mentioned that he sexually harassed his, uh, her mom 30 plus years ago, right? Something like that. It's like, okay, fine. Let's say he did sexually harass her mom in the most vile way you can possibly think of 30 years ago. That doesn't change anything. Her, his mom still married him. And something he did 30 years ago shouldn't make him irredeemable, an irredeemable dragon to be slain today. And because she viewed the entire interaction as though monstrous snake next to infant daughter, she readied herself for battle, which she even says in there. And because she has that framework, the entire interaction is overly confrontational. So there's only two choices here. If the guy is in fact an abusive monster, then she's a shitty mom for having her daughter around him in the first place. But if he's a loving grandpa, 
then she's a shitty mom for trying to ruin their relationship over nothing. All because she allowed an ideology to possess her entire action. That wasn't her. That was the ideology acting for her. She's so possessed of that worldview that, that the ideology fought the phantom of its like own making in this patriarchal male. Like he doesn't, he's just a guy. He's not the patriarchy. The patriarchy doesn't exist like that. And the same thing's happening with all these people out there in the streets for BLM. They see the whole world as oppressed and oppressor and they're ideolo ideologically possessed of it. And they're out there burning the system down because it's the manifestation of the evil white oppressor, the colonizer. The statues must come down. The courthouses must be burned to the ground. It's not them making those decisions. That's the ideology acting through them. In the same way it acted through the Auschwitz prison guards, in the same way it acted through the, the Leninists that rounded up the Kulaks and marched them into Siberia to starve. Of course that's justified because they're the evil bourgeoisie. It's the same thing. It's all the same thing. When you allow an ideology to control how you view the world, you're a slave to it. And then it acts through you in ways you can't even understand. Cause you to screw up a relationship with your grandfather for no reason. Why? Because you had to make a point. You could have ended the uncomfortable situation and been an adult and a mature adult. Walk over and pick up your kid, be a mom, but don't forget your daughter too. Diffuse it. Yeah. Versus incite it. Correct. She wanted the conflict. She craved it. And it wasn't even her. The ideology wanted the conflict. It wanted that outcome. It wanted to see that man retreat from play with his granddaughter. I mean, if you just think about how sick and twisted that is, look, like you have to make the assumption that grandpa's a good guy. Otherwise, the mom's a real piece of shit for even having the daughter around him. There's no excuse. So you can't, there's no telling perspective wise of this story in which the mom comes out clean. She's either a slave to an ideology and like is a complete and total um, uncontrolled raging monster for the ideology, right? Or she's a terrible mom for allowing her, her child to play with a snake in the first place. It can't be both. She can't be a good mom either way. Wow. You know, see, this is why I like talking to you because you take something that looks innocuous. And of course I fall into the trap where I'm walking down the same path as everybody else that's reading the story or reading the post. And then you dissect it and, and kind of slice it and dice it. And not in a manipulative way, but in a way that's revealing of what are the underpinnings of the actions of the characters in the story. But yeah, no, I, I, I think that that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought on that particular post. Did you post anything back on that? Um, I, I did, but I won't say what I posted to not out my own identity here. Cause you could Google that pretty easily. I think and find it. Gotcha. So I did, I, I called down the feminist whirlwind on that one. Um, it was an interesting thing. I, I actually, I taunted the ideology directly rather than her. I attacked the ideology in my first post and it elicited quite a few replies uh, immediately following. So, hmm. it, you know what, just to a lot of their credit, um, once I explained what I explained to you just now in a long drawn out form, they stopped. They, they, I think they actually, they actually thought through the implications of what I was saying, but it's hard, man. It, you know, it's one of the reasons I think that zombie movies are so popular nowadays is that we have such a, a, a prevalence of ideologically possessed zombies. They're not even there. They, 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 and what I mean by that is. If I were to sit down and talk to the lady that wrote this, she would tell me nothing interesting because she wouldn't be in the conversation. I would simply be having a conversation with a feminist ideology. That's it. And every single thing that came up in that conversation, I would already know ahead of time because I understand the ideology. She's not 
she's not an individual anymore. She's allowed herself to become mindless. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, that makes sense. Well, and, and add on to the fact that ideology spreads quickly, right? It does. And I, I really think that's why the zombie stuff picked up recently is, is that that really symbolically represents the, the infection of ideology and the death of the individual, right? Like, you get bitten and then and then you become a mindless zombie only walking around trying to convert others to your ideology. Hmm. Like I think I think that's what those that the story is telling us is the, the is the dangers of ideological possession. Who knows? It could also just be people like killing zombies. I don't know, man. But <laughs> it was it's an interesting take on it, I think. I don't know. I, you know, I, like I like think that's what it is. I like that analogy. You gotta write that down and and definitely make sure you you use that in a in another podcast or one of your your, your other individual ones. It just go dive into the zombie mythologies. Zombie mythologies and ideology <laughs> catching fire. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fair. I'll, maybe I'll dive into The Walking Dead or something as a, I don't know, man. I have trouble watching. I find I can only watch certain shows anymore. Um, I have a lot of trouble watching series and, and story forms because I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what it is about me. Like, for instance, that post, right? My initial reaction to the post is just exactly what I explained to you. I don't know why I'm somehow immune to her language. Like, I can just see it when I'm reading it. She, she, says, she, she says, looms behind my three-year-old. His breath, right? Like, her body tenses, right? There's, there's just the way she wrote it. Like, I immediately understood how I was being manipulated or that she was attempting to manipulate me. And... And then, and then, I mean, really, the, as soon as she said the last thing, fighting the patriarchy one grandpa at a time, I just laughed. And I'm like, is that really, is that really how you want your family dinners to be framed? As some sort of epic fight against the patriarchy with your grandpa as its proxy? Like, how are you ever going to have a healthy family relationship if that's how you're treating your life? And here's the thing, I can glean a lot of information from, from her post. First off, this is her first kid, guaranteed. At the time she wrote this, this child was her oldest child. And it's probably her only child, although I don't, I'm not as sure of that. I am for sure that it's her oldest child. The second thing that I can tell you is that she does not have a healthy relationship with her family, her mom included. And her mom is right. She was overreacting, and that's why you got scorned by her, and she wasn't talking to you after you did that, because you blew up needlessly on a man who was simply trying to play with your daughter. Like, stop. <laughs> yeah. Like, even, like, look, you don't punish people for doing what you want them to do, but failing at it. Or it, When they attempt to do what you want them to do and they fail at it because they don't do it well enough, you don't punish them you encourage and correct, right? You want, uh, notionally, if he's a good stepfather, you want him playing with your, your daughter. You want that, you want that positive patriarchal role model because guess what? The patriarchy both has positive and negative connotations. You want that because it gives structure, right? You, what you should do if he's not picking up on the clues is like, hey dad, she's getting overwhelmed. So, that, and you do it in a loving way, right? Not a not a scolding feminist battle cry, but a, hey, hey dad, like she's overwhelmed. She needs a break. That way he, 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 can, he has the opportunity for correcting his own behavior and picking up on this, whatever he missed in his initial approach, right? It's not, don't ever do that again. It's dad, we want you to do that. You just need to do it the right way and be aware of this. You get what I'm saying? Like, she didn't do any of that. She just treated it like a freaking war, which is how, how we treat so much of stuff nowadays because we're all ideologically possessed. Everything's a war. Everything, everything needs to be purged and 
dismantle, dismantle the patriarchy, dismantle the colonizer government, dismantle oh, everything, dude. It's so, so taxing. And that's why I can't even watch movies and stuff anymore, is it's every, every screenwriter nowadays is ideologically possessed. And they, they, like in the Moana story, like it's hard for me to watch movies like that because they just, it's incessant. They continually put these little ideological like battle cries in there. You know, in places it just doesn't even matter. Like at the end of the Avengers movie, was I don't remember which one it was called, whatever the last one is, um, you know, the whole movie was, was actually decent. I mean, Fat Thor bothered me a little bit, but beyond Fat Thor, the end of the movie, like the, in the final battle against Thanos, they just, they just couldn't have let it be normal. They couldn't just have the female heroes fight alongside the male heroes. They had to make a point of like, all right, girls, let's go. And like, it's girl power. Like it doesn't, it, it didn't do anything for the movie. They, they just, they had to like throw it in there. They had to throw it in there because in their mind, women are still oppressed. And they needed to be told that they don't have to be oppressed because there's still a war to fight. So rally together, girls. The patriarchy still exists and we have to take it down. Oh, it's so tiresome. So speaking of Fat Thor, by the way, uh, I read an article that said that a lot of that was improv by Chris Hemsworth. Yeah. So he really enjoyed doing that and so they they <laughs> actually made that part longer than it should have been yeah and I, I think that the fat thor part of that was was like it, it actually worked in the story right because he's like depressed and like he has given up hope and i think i think i remember reading something similar where they originally had written him to be back in shape by the final battle right like he he had fully like redeemed himself and and came back right something like that but mm -hmm. Hemsworth had, had liked Fat Thor so much that he like wanted to keep Fat Thor, um, <laughs> which, you know, it's fine. It, it, it doesn't bother me, but they missed the redemption of him, right? Like, because when you, when you have a hero that loses faith, you need to show him back stronger than ever with faith, right? Like, that's, that's what you should show. He shouldn't be fat and with faith. Like, doesn't help. Like, <laughs> he should be stronger than he was before after having lost faith and regained it, right? Sure. Yeah. So... And I, I don't have a problem with it from an ideological perspective. I, it's just a myth. It was a mythology blunder is all. So I don't know, man. And then, you know, at the end, at the, you know, people made a lot about the, the passing of Thor's torch to, I forget who the Valkyrie was, what her name was. Um, I don't know about any of that. I, well, I, I do know what I think, but it's just not like, I don't know if those are the battles that we need to be fighting. It does, it does, one of the things I can say that does bother me some is, it, and it comes back to the, the racial lensing of it, is that, you know, the, this is, and this just goes to the ideological possession of the writers, right? Like, Asgard as a, as a place is Norse. So you would expect all of the residents of it to be European American, or Europeans in general, excuse me. But instead, you have a, a diverse population of Asgard, which makes sense given that we need to modernize the story for what we have now. The one caveat I have with that is that if you're going to do that lensing to bring it into modern day, then when you tell the story of Black Panther in Africa, it shouldn't just be black people either. You get my point? Like, it should be the same. You should have, you should have the same ideology, or not even ideology. You should have the same methodology to, to modernize the story if that makes any mm -hmm. sense across the board yeah yeah if, if everything is going to be a show of the power of diversity then showing a homogenous people only is only okay if it's black is the same problem right like there's something wrong with that <sighs> yeah i don't know i i I would say that that it's also interesting, and this could obviously be another podcast in itself, because um, we did dive into a lot of, uh, you know, stereotypes and racism and such in in, in this topic. But um, I've I've watched a lot of uh, a lot of black comedies, 
um and and it's it is interesting how uh how race is conveyed comedically in a lot of those movies and and how easy it is for those movies to basically insult and demonize mostly the white race which is i don't know i i just thought that was interesting and and i always kind of try to put myself in other people's shoes in that capacity i, I forget what movie it was and it was a, it was a stupid movie it was uh it was a, a bunch of women going on a bachelorette party and it was a it was a black comedy um and i think it was uh queen latifah yeah who ended up saying it and uh somebody somebody went on a zip what's that what did she say well so so somebody went on a zip line and it was a, a young college white kid and it was in uh i think it was in louisiana or something and she said oh that's some white boy shit right there yeah. as in like there's no way i'm doing that that's that's crazy right well look, and i was like i was like wow do you think what what do you think the ramifications would be if that was said in a in a in a just a regular mainstream movie right for any other race well and so i think that's the point is my personal opinion is i don't i lampoon anything you want i think i think we need way more comedy and if 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 it's funny about whatever group of people x group of people say it right it's fine stereotypes are, you know you can you can you can lampoon a stereotype because they're not an individual and that's kind of what's cool about comedy is you can make fun of a group without ever making fun of any given individual and i think that's that's an important thing because it keeps everyone from too closely identifying with any group like you don't like one of the you know hold on a second let me give you a good quote like there it is hang on let me let me get this oh so one of the one of the best poems that i've ever read i love it, is if by uh, rudyard kipling right and my one of my favorite lines in this is that well, there's a lot of good lines but hang on where's it at i'll just read the whole thing have you heard this one uh-uh all right if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies or being hated. Don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss. And lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone. And so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds but keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither for foes nor loving friends can hurt you. If all men count with you but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. The line I really like in there is if all men count with you, but none too much, right? Like you should, and I really like that perspective. It's like, you should, you should view yourself as part of, of, of mankind and all mankind and all men should count with you, but you shouldn't, let any of them count too much with you. Like you shouldn't be tied like that to other people in that, that, that are just notionally grouped with you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like you should always, you should always, first of all, I really like that poem. It's a cool poem, but what was I saying? Saying something. 
Oh, the lampooning. The the I I I don't I don't get offended by people lampooning stereotypes which I may or may not fall into. What I get offended by is the fact that it's only okay for them to lampoon my stereotypes and it's not okay to lampoon the reverse because the ideology doesn't allow it. And it's really the ideological possession that makes that happen, right? Like in the ideology that everyone is so possessed by right now, the oppre- you you can't you can you can't punch down. That's what everyone says. You're punching down. Quit punching down. What that means is if you're part of the oppressor class, you shouldn't be making fun of the oppressed class, which is just it's just stupid. Because you're you're already allowing Engel to win. Like I I I don't think groups can be oppressed. I think people can be oppressed. And I think all people are oppressed. And the whole point of Christianity is to take responsibility for your own oppression and overcome it. That's it. Take responsibility for your own oppression and overcome it. Period. That's the story of Christ in a nutshell. He was oppressed. He was nailed to the cross. And at the very end, forgive them, Father, for they know that which they've done. He didn't ever allow the responsibility for his oppression to be on the group. It was his. He took responsibility for it. And in, and in so doing, he absolved them of their sin. That's the theory, at least. So if everyone were to quit doing that, quit letting other people be responsible for your oppression, take responsibility for it of yourself and overcome it. Transcend it. Transcend your own suffering. What would you say to somebody who would would say to you that maybe you don't understand as much because you're a white male and you don't understand that like what the what the plight is and and maybe it's not that easy as just overcoming and transcending your oppression? Nobody said it's easy, number one. And number two, they have no idea about my background and the fact that they're making assumptions about the level of privilege that I've come from or the, the journey my life's taken or the journey my father's life's taken or his father or his father before him on and on and up is a result of their ideological possession. I don't, I don't claim to understand all the ins and outs of their life they shouldn't claim to understand all the ins and outs of mine. The only thing I'm stating is that the ins and outs of their life are as irrelevant as the ins and outs of mine. At the end of the day, their life is theirs. They should take responsibility for everything in it because to do otherwise leads Makes to hell. You doesn't help them. The only practical approach, if your life isn't what you want it to be, is to take responsibility for it and turn it into what you want it to be. That's it. That's it. There's no there's nothing else. You are responsible for everything in your life. Every interaction that goes south, every failure you have, every success you have. You're responsible for all of it. So take responsibility. Don't don't cop out and say I didn't get into Harvard because I'm X race. I'm not rich because I'm X sex. They didn't, they didn't like my presentation that I gave to the board because I'm a female. Don't, don't, don't allow yourself that weakness. It's weakness. You own it. Because if you think that way, you'll never, you'll never adjust and overcome. I can't possibly climb this hill because there's a wall on it. We'll figure out how to go over the wall. You're the one who didn't know there was a wall in the way. You got to figure out how to climb it. Everyone has walls. They have to climb. Everybody. You don't know mine. I don't know yours. But yours are your responsibility. That makes sense. It's, it's back to that extreme ownership, the Jocko. Yeah, man, he's right. It's all one idea. It's the great idea of Western civilization. That's why Jesus is the centerpiece, man. You have the perfect man persecuted on a cross and the crucifix is 
the central image of Western civilization. What does that mean? It means the appropriate perspective is own your own oppression, carry your own cross up the hill, and take responsibility for your own life. That's what that symbol means in its core. I mean, Jesus wouldn't be worshipped if he had been on the on the cross being like, you people all put me up here. How dare you? Like, it's your fault I'm up. I mean, who does that? <laughs> like, nobody does that, right? No hero is up on the cross being oppressed, complaining about the oppressors. That's not what a hero does. And the ultimate hero does definitely doesn't do that. That's not an aspire. You shouldn't aspire to that mode of being to just rant and rave about how unjust your end is, unjust your persecution is. It's just so weak, man. It's disgusting, but whatever. I hope my daughters never do that, man. I, that's the other thing that I worry about every day, man. I have five daughters, five of them. Like, and they're raised in this world where people who say they're feminists hate femininity and they attempt to like androgenize everything suppress genuine feminine feminine traits and replace them with these masculine abominations like they just don't fit like it's rough to watch it, it's just rough to watch right like there's like you know nowadays we're like don't don't give little girls dolls don't you give them baby dolls don't do it you're, you're just reinforcing gender stereotypes i think like, it just flip that on its head and like think about what it's doing to a, to a little girl she she instinctually wants to nurture for a baby and obviously so like of course she's gonna want to that's the way we all get here right like that's the way it works and you're telling her that that, that totally healthy emulation of proper proper infant nurture is negative bad what the fuck is wrong with you like i'm just sorry <laughs> so, so it's overwhelming man it's overwhelming yeah i can't imagine and then what ends up happening is that they if they don't this is and i'm going to purely speculate here i'm going to piss off a lot of people We have this, we have this epidemic of fur parents in our society. And I can't help but just think that like, it's all these repressed infant circuits within mainly females, but males too. I, I don't think males don't normally call themselves fur parents. Although I would say that dogs have hacked the oxytocin cycle of some males. But specifically on females, they treat their dogs like like infants. They dress them up, like they. I've seen I've seen them put diapers on dogs. Like, like, just. It's this really weird. I mean, I, I know it seems normal to us, to some people, but if you really just think about it, it's weird. You're 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 nurturing another species, sterilized thing like. And it, 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 the, the, those behaviors are, are primarily riding on the infant nurturing circuits that are imprinted for nurturing of your own offspring. And we're not having those, so I think since they're, they need something to do, you end up having people treating their dogs like their kids, taking their dogs on airplanes and shit. Like, that wasn't a thing when I was a kid. Nobody flew with their little Pomeranian in a cage on the seat next to them. That's a thing no. now. <laughs> no, I, 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 I can agree. It's funny you bring that up, and and we we should probably do a podcast on that because that'd be that'd be pretty funny. But <laughs> yeah, I'm all right. So so again, I I'm heavily into uh, you know one of my other hobbies is is real estate, and I'm heavily into real estate research right now with demographics and the shifting of what's going on with, you know, single family homes and, and rentals and multifamily properties and the, the typical renter in a multifamily property. And one of the articles was talking about how 
a lot of uh, younger millennials now are, well, I don't even want to call it millennials. I, I, I don't even like using that word, but a lot, a lot of younger people now who are renting properties are picking properties specifically because of their animals or their pets. Yeah. So they're picking properties not based on their children, not based on their spouse or their partner. They're picking it based off of what are the accommodations are going to be best for Fido. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. Like, you just, like, that's, it's so dysfunctional. I don't even want to, like, I know, look, I, I'm, I'm aware that there are a lot of people that think that their dogs are people and part of their family. And that's fine. You know, we have developed a symbiotic relationship with, with dogs specifically. And we evolved, to, we co-evolved, right? Ish. But to treat your dog as though it's a stand-in for your having your own children just blows me away, man. Blows me away. All right, man. I think that's a good place to call it for the day. So uh, I'd like to thank you for coming on with me. And uh, as always, everyone, uh, if you guys disagree with anything or have any comments about the content we've covered, please shoot me a note at cronius.focus at gmail.com or throw a comment in the YouTube comments. And uh, if you feel really strongly and be, would be willing to rebut anything that's been said in here, um, you know, basically on a call with me, uh, send me a note stating that and uh, we'll see what we can do. All right, guys. Thanks again. Bye.